Hilfe. All right, we are ready to start the next session here. So, uh, the next one we have uh, Nicholas, yeah. who will be talking a little bit about uh, some of the work that he's been doing around NVMe drives. So, let's uh, take it away. Hi, good morning. I'm Nicholas Poggi from the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. And today I'm going to talk and show some benchmark results, uh, both on the system level, so the device level, and also on the application side. On the application side, our application use case is HBase, and the drives we're testing are MBME. MBME drives, non-volatile memory uh, express, are basically SSDs on a PCIe uh, bus. So that's what this talk is about. This work is a collaboration between um, Barcelona Supercomputing and Rackspace US. Uh, and it's half uh, academic and half industrial. This is the first part of our research project. So we're uh, welcoming feedback and, and contributions to, to the results you'll see. Okay, so the outline, I'm going to first introduce BSC and at the Aloja project, why we're doing this, a bit of the motivation. And then we're going to get into system level uh, benchmark of the NVMe devices just to set expectations of the maximum performance we can get from the drives. And then we're going to get into the core of the presentations, which are the HBase uh, benchmarks, uh, separated in two parts. One is a read-only workload, where we uh, get the, the most of the benefits of the benchmarks. And then a, a mixed workload, where we're actually deleting, updating, inserting data into the, the stuff. Okay, so the Barcelona Supercomputing Center is the Spanish National Supercomputing Facility. We, have a, we host the Mare Nostrum Supercomputer. And this year, through the European Commission and Spanish government, we're getting the new version, Mare Nostrum 4. For you interested in supercomputing and HPC, follow the news. Uh, we're basically based in the Technical University of Catalonia in Barcelona. And um, so most of the people in the center are either professors, uh, students, or, or PhDs. And so we have a, a very academic uh, track. And we also have partnerships with industry players. The reason I'm presenting these results is we've been working in the Hadoop big data ecosystem since around 2008, first on schedulers and making sure that a concurrent job finish in time. And for the past year, we have been embarked in a benchmarking project for uh, Hadoop ecosystem applications, specifically in cloud and HPC uh, archi uh, architectures. So this Aloja project, um, is uh, the idea is it's an open data and open source project, and the idea is to automate characterization of new hardware deployments and, opti and optimize software configuration. And throughout these three years, we have built a benchmarking platform you can download and play with it. Uh, basically, that's the provisioning of the clusters, either on-premise or cloud. Um, it set up the application you need to benchmark for, let's say, in this case, HBase and Hadoop. And uh, it can run the different tests and change the configuration between the different test runs. And uh, after we run the benchmarks, we collect the results in an online repository. This is available online, so you can browse uh, the results of the benchmarks. And on top of that, we're doing some analytics, or we're doing uh, performance metric analytics and high-level metadata uh, learning and also prediction models on try to find out and automate how to improve the performance of these systems. Um, we collaborate a lot with the industry and academia. Um, this work in particular, Rackspace is present, and we got some support from Intel um, to make sure that their drives are configured properly. Okay, so a bit of the motivations for the results I'm going to show you. Uh, here I have some results. The actual numbers are not too important, but uh, we got a new cluster with MBME devices that are supposedly to be very fast. And so we said, okay, let's run TerraSort. TerraSort is like the default uh, benchmark for Hadoop applications, and let's run it. And this first bar is, lower is better, so this is running time in seconds. But this first bar, um, shows the TeraSort, sorting one terabyte of data, in Hadoop on, only on the MVME drives. And we get this number. And then we tried a combination of, we had a JBot on this cluster I'm going to present later. And then we tried, let's use the JBot, 10 disks plus the M M MVME drive. We got this number very similar to the first one. 
Uh, of course, we have more this here. This could happen. But then we, s we said, OK, let's only use the JBot. And we had the third bar. And then let's say, oh, let's only use five disks of the JBot. And uh, we had uh, less than 10% performance difference with only using the MEV devices. So we're saying, what's going on here? We've been running this code uh, for years. Uh, we know Hadoop is set up correctly. These are set up correctly. Um, why, don't, why aren't we getting a good performance increase from these drives? When we switch from um, rotational drives to SSD some years back, we saw up to 3x, so 300% performance increase. So um, initially, we wanted to see the uh, benefits of using NVMe drives. So our motivations are to explore use cases for big data where this, uh, this type of drive makes sense. Um, we had this poor initial result, so we contacted Intel, and they supplied us an H-based use case that we tried to replicate. And we also wanted to measure um, the possibilities of these drives and actually get uh, extend our platform into uh, benchmarking the devices, not only the, the big data clusters. And we find out that it, it is a challenge to produce um, big data application level benchmark that actually stresses a hardware completely. So the reason for the marginal gains here is that the, this is a very high-end hardware and maybe the workload is very small or that the JBot is really fast. So let's, let's look at that into detail. So the cluster specification, oh, you don't see on the screen. So uh, let's uh, maybe like this. Okay, let's use this format then. So the cluster specification, we have five nodes. One is the master for working nodes, CentOS uh, 7, uh, 128 GBs of RAM per node. The master has a, like a RAID 10 uh, disk for the data. The OS is, is different, 10 gigabit network. And on the working nodes, we have uh, the NVMe drives, uh, 1.6 terabyte of storage, and a JBot, a SAS JBot of 10, uh, 15 RPM, um, um, Seagate uh, disks. The, in the slides, you will find later the reference if you want to see them. So the NVMe drives we're testing is the Intel P3608. It's not the newest from this year, but it's from a year back, or a year and a half back. Um, it promises five gigabytes of uh, read, both random and um, unsequential read throughput, and um, um, a write bandwidth of two gigabytes uh, per second, so five to two uh, gigabytes per second, and the list, the price is around 10k US dollars that I searched uh, <coughs> last week when doing the slides. Um, we also have a second NVMe device. This is uh, an older generation. It's an LSI Nitro warp drive. It's from 2012. The current market price for this one is 4k per unit, but uh, it was, when it was released, it was around 12K. Uh, this, this disk we're just using for um, verification and validation. This is in another cluster. And uh, what's different of the drives is the first one is PCIe 3 with eight lanes, and the other one is PCIe 2. So it's an older generation. Um, OK, let's start with the FIO benchmark. FIO is a flexible IO benchmark. In my opinion, it's one of the best uh, benchmarks to measure this performance. You can talk more about later that. And what we want to do with uh, FIO is, uh, first, we want to assert the vendor specs. So you, get the, uh, you buy a disk, or you're going to buy a disk, and you get these numbers from the vendor of what the disk is supposed to do. We want to verify if we can really achieve these numbers, or, or those are only on ideal conditions. The second part is uh, we want to make sure that we have the hardware set up correctly. For example, on these Intel drives, we had to update the firmware to actually get them performing well or to, the, to their most capacity. So this is something important. And we also want to set performance expectations. So let's look at some results of maximum bandwidth. So this is megabytes per second that we can achieve in a cluster. So let me guide you through the results. There, all of the data will be on the slides. So I'm just going to highlight uh, certain things. Um, so each color here is a different benchmark. We start with random read, uh, random write is the orange, uh, random write, uh, no, this is uh, sequential read is the gray, and uh, random, uh, sequential write is the yellow. So 
Um, the both the highest bar here, this is higher is better. This is throughput megabytes per second. And um, both these Intel drives get close to five uh, gigabytes per second bandwidth. The, here the random is a bit lower. The spec says the same, but we got very close numbers to the spec. And for the uh, write, we get that two gigabytes promise in, in the spec with a particular configuration of FIO. So this is with the configuration that we got the best results. This is what I'm showing just to compare the disk. Then second here, we have the SAS JBOT, the 15 RPM rotational drive. And here's the 10 disk combined. One thing that we can see is that the random reads and writes are much lower than the NVMe devices, but the 10 disks together has almost two gigabytes, uh, gigabit, yeah, gigabytes uh, throughput bandwidth. This will be the result with only one disk, which gets the numbers that you would expect from a single uh, SAS drive below 200 megabytes per second uh, read and write. Um, so sequential is quite good on the JBOT. And here's our, uh, our other PCIe Express uh, drive that actually comes with two disks. So this is the results we will get with only one disk. And pretty much we get double the results with a second uh, while using the two disks together. Um, we see that the maximum bandwidth on this one is around uh, four gigabytes per second. And the random writes are a bit below two gigabytes per second, but not so different from the newer generation Intel drives uh, we got. So about latency, um, we did some tests also to see the latency of these devices. Um, all of the MVME devices has a very good uh, uh, latency, so here lower is better. It's below 400 uh, microseconds, uh, both for reads and writes. And the JBOT, as we expected, uh, on the SAS drive, we get a higher um, a latency when we do random reads uh, and writes. But when we do uh, sequential, the latency is quite low, and even below uh, 300 microseconds in, in some cases. Uh, this is with a particular FIO test with um, 64K in request size and one in IO depth. FIO has a lot of uh, configuration options. In the end slides, I will give the, the summary of them. And yeah, there's some notes on the slides for later. So let's get into the application. So HBase. HBase is uh, the big data, uh, big database uh, for, for non-SQL. It's built on top of Hadoop. You can actually put it into any file system, but usually people put it on top of HDFS uh, for storage and safekeeping. And it has good properties, uh, close to real time and low latency for random access. And this is uh, surprising for a Hadoop ecosystem type of project. And it's being used a lot in production. And usually uh, HBase is sort of a building block for other big data projects. So um, some other projects that have a SQL interface that actually store the data through HBase. So let's see how the HBase model works. Every time you do a write, it will be a put in the system, put a, a value in the system. Um, this data is written directly to disk into the write ahead log for safekeeping, but it's also put on the Java heap space into a mem store. So you can, we can serve it uh, directly from RAM very fast. This gives uh, HBase a low latency. Every once in a while, the, the buffers are flushed to HDFS disk <coughs> into the H files. And if it's not in the mem uh, store, data is written uh, read, uh, read from HDFS it goes into the block cache. A block, a block is the unit of a storage in HBase, of different types of storage. And the block cache is a, call it a level one type of cache with LRU, least recently used um, algorithm to evict uh, a least frequently used um, blocks. So in latest versions of HBase, I have added something called the bucket cache. A bucket cache, you can think of, of a level two cache that can be off heap. So um, you can have HBase controlling um, a larger uh, piece of uh, memory for, for its cache. Um, it's fixed size. You, uh, when you set it up, you say what size you want it. 
you can set it up on heap, actually on your Java heap space, but we don't recommend uh, that option. We only found marginal improvements and you will be competing with the, already with the block cache. Uh, you can set it up off heap, so a uh, different um, Java interface and different Java heap space uh, through Java NIO. And the interesting part is you can set it also to any file on the file system. In this case, we put it in the NVMe drive and also into a RAM disk for testing. So here you have the schematic, is the, here's the Java heap space, and then you have off heap the level two cache for edge space. So we performed several experiments. Let me summarize them. So first we have a, a baseline, edge base 1.24, um, without any special tuning and without bucket cache. The second is, uh, let's put the bucket cache on the off heap, but managed by, uh, by Java. Uh, let's try that also into a RAM disk. Let's put uh, the bucket cache into a RAM disk, and let's put the bucket cache into an MVME uh, file um, hosted on the, on the drive. The difference here is that, of course, we cannot allocate all of our RAM for, uh, for caching, so we use 32 GBs of RAM for the RAM nodes, the RAM uh, configurations, and 250 GBs per worker on, on the MVME devices. So MVME has a larger cache size. This is as expected as we have a larger uh, drive than uh, we have memory. Um, so the experiments that I'm going to show are, uh, most of them are read-only. The first group of them are, let's try a use case where we are only reading data and then a mixed type of workload. The benchmark is YCSB. I will get into the benchmark a bit later. And the payload is generating around 250 million records, which accommodate to two terabytes of raw HDFS storage. We're using replication of one here, so uh, this is the actual size that is stored in disk. Uh, so let's get into the read-only benchmarks, the gets, so doing a get from HBase. We're using 500 threads to read the data in, in the benchmark. Okay, so let me guide you through the group of results. Each of these group of bars is a different disk configuration from the four we have, and each color is a different run, a sequential run, so this is, will be the first run for the baseline, second one, and third one. One thing that we can see is that the first run is always a bit slower than the rest of uh, the runs, so this means the cache was cold, uh, there was no cache in there, but we can see that the second and third runs, they have the same times here, higher is better, this is throughput in operations per second, and this yellow line you see here is latency, and latency lower the better. Uh, we can see that uh, bucket cache off heap and run disk have very similar results, so either if you put it managed by Java or you just mount a, into a file system, a tempfs file system, you get very similar results. And the bucket cache can speed up a bit more the, the result. In, at the end, uh, the bucket cache gets 2x the performance benefit from uh, the baseline and 50% more than the RAM disk uh, strategies. So um, let's look at how this looks on the, on the uh, server level on the performance metrics. So this is the average CPU for the baseline execution. Each vertical bar here is showing um, a, a different run. So this is the first one, second, and third. You can see that's pretty stable, except that in the beginning here, this red part, this is weight IO. Uh, the, the graph here in the bottom, it measures the read performance from the disk. And we see here a, a huge orange spike that gets to two gigabytes per second. Um, and what is basically happening is that at the beginning of the run, uh, files are being read from disk. Uh, we have the wait IO, but then uh, memory is being filled in. Either Java heap space, this blue space, or the OS uh, buffer cache. So basically it's only reading from the disk on the first seconds of the execution, and then it's caching everything either on heap or on the on the OS, or the OS is doing that for us. Network is quite constant. Network is not a uh, bottleneck for any of these tests. Um, so we were saying, okay, so we're not actually measuring too much the disk performance. Everything is being cached in RAM. 
Um, so there are a couple of strategies that you can follow. Let's look at the, yeah, first let's look at the other uh, examples. On the off heap, uh, there's a write, there's a read throughout all of the execution. Uh, this is for the temporary tempfs RAM disk. And this will be for the bucket cache. In the bucket cache example that is twice as fast, you can see that actually the cache is being filled in as, uh, as we execute the first benchmark. One thing is that we cannot, uh, with these metrics tools, we cannot see the, how memory is being written or accessed by the tools. And this is one of the improvements we need to make for all tools. But uh, what is happening is that the OS buffer cache is being really effective on these clusters and we're really stressing the, the hardware. So the challenge is to actually how we can um, benchmark the drives outside of the, the buffer cache. One thing is to, one strategy will be to build a very large workload. And we did some tests of building terabytes of data, but they take uh, days to run. We cannot uh, spend days just waiting to see if uh, something finished and then days to process uh, all of the data generated. So the approaches we took were uh, limiting the available RAM in the nodes to, we lower the RAM available to the OS to 32 GBs instead of 128. And the second experiment is actually to drop the, buff, the OS buffer cache every 10 seconds. So what happens here if we uh, limit the memory, simulating that the cluster has lower resources, baseline and the oops, baseline and the RAM strategies, they have a pretty similar time, while on the bucket cache where we have this external memory uh, that is not in RAM, uh, we get up to X, 8x, so 100% performance improvement if the, the nodes had less capacitor capacity. In the, so if we look at the CPU charts for the four different strategies, we see the red here is weight IO, so it's, uh, the bottleneck is reading from disks. Um, but on the bucket catch example, as things are not so slow as reading from the JBOT and we have the data already in LRU cache, it, it, it gets to be eight times faster. Um, the disk read throughput is around 2.5 gigabytes uh, per second, stable for all of the three strategies, except for the uh, MBME where we get 38 uh, gigabytes per second throughput for the whole cluster. This is uh, aggregated throughout the cluster. So the, the read throughput is actually quite high. On the second example where we drop the buffer cache, uh, we do get some improvements by using the RAM disk and off heap and, and RAM. So we're able to measure this, but the improvement is um, marginal. It's less than uh, 1x, uh, 50%. And in this case, the bucket cache uh, has a performance improvement of uh, 9x. Um, of course, these running times, the total running times are longer than on the first experiments where we had all of the run, but this is a way that has been useful to actually see what will be the, the capacity and what, what can, can we expect from the drives. Okay, the next set of experiments we did is, are related to running the whole uh, benchmark. Uh, YCSB has uh, several uh, use cases uh, we were using workload C in the first example that is read only, but there's a, a read update workload, uh, mostly read workload, update workload, and uh, read modified type of write workloads. Since these workloads add new data to the, to the workload, we cannot run them repeatedly, sequentially as we did before, because we're actually increasing the, the size of the storage. So, they recommended to run them from work, workload A to F. We're skipping workload E uh, because it's quite slow as it does some scans and uh, we couldn't finish in time if not, if we would have run it. Um, so very quickly on these results, when we were running the mixed workloads, we have three strategies, baseline, uh, RAM, and bucket cache. Each line is a different, uh, each bar is a different benchmark. And just quickly summarizing on the speed up, on the data generation, there is no speed up by using a cache, it's write only. Uh, and in some benchmarks, we get more speed up, um, but the most we get is around 2x. Le uh, no, in this case, uh, no, uh, sorry, it's uh, less than 1x. It's around 50% uh, 
improvement by using the NVMe drives on this uh, scenario. Um, also with the RAM uh, strategies. So we're actually not getting even 100% improvement if uh, we're doing uh, like a more production style uh, workload where we're also adding data and updates. So on this uh, set of experiments, we also limited the RAM to 32 G uh, GBs per node, and the speed up was higher as expected, but it was around 87% for the NVMe case. This is the average of all of the different workloads, and we got uh, an improvement of around 87%. So uh, how does this look on uh, CPU? This will be baseline, all of the different workloads sequentially, and this case will be the, the NVMe. Uh, weight IO is the main uh, bottleneck. If we look at the disk charts, we see what's going on here. Uh, data is being generated, this is the blue part, and then all the orange area is uh, being read from the JBot, or, uh, yeah, pretty much from the JBot, and the rest is in the OS buffer cache. On the case of the NVMe, we do have more writes during the execution, and here's the updates on some of the workloads, but basically we get a more constant uh, read throughput and with higher peaks of around 25 GBs per second. So actually, the drives are being used, they're being used quite effectively, but uh, the OS buffer cache is uh, really helpful for HBase and um, HDFS in general. Here's just some charts with the network and memory, just to keep on the slides if someone wants to check later. Uh, the network is not the bottleneck and is highly used uh, when generating the data, actually. Okay, yes. Um, um, okay, let's get to the summary and conclusions of this work. So, uh, with Bucket Cache, we've been able to increase the performance of HBase especially putting the files into an M NVMe drive. However, it was surprising that the speed up uh, was around 2x for uh, the base case scenario where we have the cache already warm and we're doing all, uh, a read-only type of workload. If we're doing a, a general workload, we get 50% uh, to 100% to improvement, which is not that much. Of course, if you can double the capacity of your cluster just by adding some hardware uh, storage, then that might be interesting. Um, but we see that uh, as you limit more, as you stress more the resources on your hardware, the benefits are higher. Uh, we wouldn't recommend to, to run the bucket cache or on heap. We would recommend it to do it always off heap, either a RAM disk or, or in a different mount point. It can also be an SSD drive, a regular SAS or SATA. Doesn't have to be NVMe to get uh, some benefits. Some of the things we have learned is that is, uh, testing uh, high-end hardware on the application level is not so uh, easy. You need to generate very big uh, workloads or try to limit the resources to find out artificially how, how much benefit you can get. But you still need to do a per device, per node, and per cluster system level or micro level uh, benchmarks. The OS buffer cache is quite effective. So if you, have, if you add more RAM, you're, you're actually speeding up your uh, application. L, an L2 cache with LRU benefits as some items are more popular than others. YCSB does a uh, long tail distribution, Cipfian type of distribution, so their items are not normally distributed. You can get more speed up there. Um, but the techniques we use to either drop the cache or limit the RAM are effective to test uh, with, with this hardware. And to conclude, I would say that NVMe devices are fast, they have very low uh, latency, but they are more expensive than, uh, than putting a JBot. Uh, big data applications are designed to work with uh, sequential reads and writes. So until we actually uh, write applications different and update the code to do random reads or even do byte address, or treat the uh, NVMe devices as if it was RAM, not a block device as, as a disk, then uh, we won't uh, be using the full benefits of this drive other than with the uh, use cases of use, using caches. Right now, for in the big data ecosystem, you need to rely on external tools uh, or some research projects to actually speed up and tire everything, and instead of using it as a cache, include it in the, in the storage file system. 
So yes, this is the first time of the first part of our work, and we welcome any feedback that you might have, and that will be all. Uh, I will leave some reference in the slides, and thank you for your attention. Yeah. Okay, I'll take some questions. Yes. Um, yes, uh, we use the, st uh, the question was, we use the stress tool to limit the RAM. So it's basically a program that fills in the RAM to the amount that you tell it. Uh, we only use it to fill the RAM, so no CPU usage. Uh, there's another option suggested that is to actually put in the boot kernel parameters, the maximum RAM. This would have been preferable, but uh, uh, we di didn't have the cluster on site. And uh, so we don't own the hardware, and I didn't want to be regenerating uh, re the uh, the intramount and FS. NVMe or like RDMA? Okay, so the question is, uh, if we looked into NVMe over fabric, so using uh, direct memory uh, RDMA uh, over InfiniBand or, or, or Roxy, uh, no, uh, I have uh, talked and worked with uh, some of the papers. Ohio State University, Professor Panda, if you look, yeah, Professor Panda, look for that. Um, they have some tests where it's experimental results where you, they do byte addressable uh, remote memory access to any devices. Uh, they show interesting numbers, but uh, um, the use case we're looking for are, is more for production uh, that we want to deploy soon and um, for that you need to modify application or run maybe not production ready code that's the reason um, the back first Uh, well, uh, there's uh, less uh, storage in RAM. We're using 32 GBs of RAM for that, and that is competing with the OF buffer cache, so you have less buffer cache and less memory for the Java heap space. And in the other, we have a per node 1.6 terabytes of storage. We're using 250, it was enough for experiments. Yes. What's your opinion? Do you feel like if you introduce something which involves a zero with the properties in the mind, the results will be much more better? I mean, if they are using some new generation file system, which might not be the Uh, yes, the question was, uh, um, we use XFS on the NVMe drives. Actually, it's mounted as a RAID, uh, a software RAID, because the, the drive comes with two disks, so we're losing some performance already there on the software RAID. Um, yes, there are other um, research, I would call them research, or uh, newer projects that uh, improve uh, a standard uh, file system, uh, file system disk. I think I named one here. There's one called SSDFS, uh, which is a file system thought for uh, flash drives. Uh, they also save your drives um, um, the, uh, so that the, the bytes don't burn out so easily. So yeah, that, that's interesting, but uh, that's ex I will call it experimental for production use case. Then. Another question? Okay, we can keep talking uh, later if you have more questions. So thanks all for your attention.